What on earth is going on? After finishing my business trip, I returned home for the first time in two years. Today, Michael should be off work. I was thrilled at the thought of seeing him after such a long time, but the moment I opened the door of the house, a strange smell wafted through, and my excitement instantly calmed down. However, at the same time, an indescribable sense of anxiety overwhelmed me. I felt like something serious had happened. Michael? I called out Michael's name as I searched around the house. But there was no sign of him anywhere. This is the only place left. I took a breath and slowly opened the bedroom door. No, Michael. What is this? Indeed, there was Michael, but he had become completely different from Michael I knew. My name is Sandra Brown. I am 32 years old. After graduating from college, I left my hometown and got a job as a sales employee at advertising company. Honestly, I had never dreamt of the industry since I was young. However, a lecture I attended at my college sparked my interest in advertising. How to create ads that attract people? What elements should be included to make an advertisement appealing? Before I knew it, I was completely engrossed in advertising and design. As I was preparing for job hunting, it was natural for me to delve into studying for a career in the advertising industry. As a result, I successfully got a job at the company I aimed for. I still remember how happy I was. It was sad to have to leave my hometown, but my heart was thrilled to have grasped my dream. However, once I joined the company, I realized it was much harder than I thought. Of course, I wasn't underestimating it. Still, reality and imagination were indeed different. I have to visit clients, make materials, find new clients, and more. There were many fun moments, but the frequent overtime, working on weekends, and business trips were tough. The kindness of all my colleagues was my salvation. Eventually, I started to wonder if this was really what I wanted to do. But then, a supportive presence appeared in my life. It was about two years after I started working. I attended a drinking party invited by a colleague, but feeling out of place, I was drinking quietly by myself when a man approached me. Are you okay, being alone like this? Yes, I'm fine. That man was Michael, who would later become my husband. He seemed to have noticed me drinking alone and come and talk to me. You seemed a bit lonely. Would you like to join me for a drink? Absolutely. At my response, he smiled kindly. As we talked, I found out that he also worked in sales. From then on, we hit it off, often venting about work. We quickly exchanged contact information to arrange a dinner together. I never imagined getting along with someone of the opposite sex at a casual drinking party. I still think it's a miracle that I met my future husband. A week later, it was the day for Michael and I to meet. Honestly, I felt a bit down. After all, that was just a booze-fueled occasion. Things just seemed to work out with the help of alcohol. But will it work if we meet in sober conditions today? With some trepidation, I met up with Michael. We entered the restaurant he had reserved. In the end, my fears were unfounded, and I had a great time with him. He was a real gentleman, interesting to talk to. He really seemed like the ideal man. Sandra, you're such a wonderful person. Oh. Stop, wonderful is an overstatement. He would give compliments that most people wouldn't say outright, seemingly without a second thought. Gradually, 
I found myself thinking about him more and more. Afterward, Michael and I started seeing each other frequently, and on our third date, he confessed his feelings, and we became a couple. The time I spent with him was truly blissful. Thanks to him, I managed to get through the tough times at work. Are you okay? Not too tired? Yeah, I'm good. I tried not to show my fatigue in front of him, but it seems he always understood. He always cared and would hug me gently each time. Two years of such life had passed. Michael finally proposed. Of course, I accepted the proposal, and we became husband and wife. I will definitely make you happy. I can never forget Michael's smiling face as he said that. After that, we completed the formal greetings with each other's families and registered our marriage. The first time I met my mill, Margaret, during the greetings, she was so kind, and I felt relieved. It turned out that my Phil had already passed away. If there's anything, please feel free to talk to me about it, okay? Yes, thank you so much. Surrounded by kind people, I wondered how lucky I was. I felt like I could overcome anything with them by my side. I was looking forward to our future life together. But then, I got caught up in something unexpected. I later regretted marrying Michael. Because a shocking truth came to light soon after our marriage. Michael couldn't do any household chores at all. Sorry, I really can't do any housework. What? How have you been living until now? Well, I just bought food from convenience stores or supermarkets, and when laundry piled up, I took it back to my parents' house. I don't even know how to use a washing machine. How could this be? Why didn't I realize this while we were dating? Michael's place always seemed neat when I visited, and he didn't seem like someone who couldn't do any housework at all. From what I gathered, he must have had his mother clean the house. Or maybe he just tidied up to make the room look presentable. That must be something only he knows. Since then, I started teaching Michael how to do household chores. But whether he didn't want to learn or couldn't learn, he remained unable to do anything I taught him. Eventually, I gave up teaching him and took on all the household duties myself. It was hard at times, but somehow I got used to this life. About two years after we got married, we had saved enough money to buy a new family home. Living in a family home is more relaxed than in an apartment, as there's less worry about noise. The neighbors were all nice, making our life even more comfortable than before. Michael and I each had our own spacious rooms, and I was happy to have more time to immerse myself in my hobbies. However, this also meant that cleaning became quite a chore. The apartment we lived in before buying the house was quite small, so cleaning was relatively easy, but it's different with a house. Since Michael was utterly incapable of doing household chores, I ended up doing everything cooking, cleaning, laundry. Even after getting a house, I was still in charge of all the household chores. Michael seemed to have given up on learning chores, and no matter how busy I was with work or household tasks, he never helped. Perhaps it was after buying the house, I began to notice something off about Michael. He seemed distant, or something like that. He didn't pay much attention to me anymore. Even when I spoke to him, his responses were curt, and it seemed like he was coming home later and later. Well, we had been married for a few years, so maybe it was normal. Still, I couldn't help feeling lonely, Hey, what time will you be coming home today? I don't know. Okay. Oh, 
Here's your lunch. Ah, uh, thanks. More than anger, I felt sadness and anxiety swirling inside me. Had I unknowingly done something to make Michael dislike me? But no matter how much I thought about it, I couldn't pinpoint anything. Well, he hadn't complained about anything to me, so maybe I shouldn't worry too much. Eventually, I began to think that this was just his true nature. That was the easiest way for me to make sense of it. It would be different if he complained about the food being bad or the house being untidy. There were several other troubling things about him. He would come home late without telling me what time. He often left his lunch I made in the morning and messed up the room even though he knew I would be cleaning. I often found his laundry scattered around his room. At first, I thought he must be tired and didn't reprimand him much. But no matter how many days passed, he didn't change his behavior. Seeing this, I finally lost my patience and confronted him. Hey, can you please be more considerate? It seems like you just scatter things around, thinking I'll clean up. I work just like you, you know, managing the household chores is hard enough already. Can't you be a little more considerate of me? Huh, are you saying I don't care about you? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. If you really cared, you take care of your own things more. And the last time I went into your room to clean, it was so messy. How can you even sleep there? Despite saying you're coming home late, you hardly tell me exactly when. Don't you think something's off? I let out all the frustrations I had been holding in at him. But he wouldn't really listen to what I was saying. I'm tired too. You're going to clean up anyway, right? And I told you I'd be late, so it should be fine. You're just too fussy. Fussy, am I? Ultimately, Michael never really listened to what I had to say. From that day on, he became even more distant towards me. Not only did he continue to respond coldly when I spoke to him, but he also started to ignore me. Even when I cleaned his room or took care of his things, he no longer thanked me. I considered giving up on the household chores several times, but I knew that no matter how messy the room got, he would just live in it. On the other hand, I couldn't stand living in a dirty room myself. I just hate to live in discomfort. After much thought, I decided to continue doing the chores for my own sake. As time passed, it seemed like Michael's attitude was returning to normal somewhat. But he remained indifferent towards me. Should I be happy that he at least started to tell me when he would be home? I wondered where the Michael I knew before marriage had gone. I had no idea he was hiding such a nature. If I had known, I might have reconsidered getting married. I began to feel the stress of work and home life every day. About half a year into this routine, my work on business trips suddenly started to increase. With both day trips and overnight stays, I was leading a very hectic life. On top of that, I had to manage the household and take care of Michael. The burden on me had become overwhelmingly large. However, perhaps because he saw what I was going through, Michael began to change gradually. Hey, Sandra, are you okay? What do you mean? You know, with the chores and work, everything. Well, here, I'm okay, I guess. I was taken aback by his sudden concern. Was Michael actually worried about me? It was such a rare occurrence. Was it in my dreams? Afterward, Michael continued to show concern for me. Have you been on business trips a lot recently? Are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. It's tough, but at least the pay is good. I see. 
I'm glad you're okay if you say so. He was hiding something, or if he was genuinely concerned. I had my doubts, but despite everything, he seemed to be genuinely concerned about me. Just knowing that made me feel happy. But Michael's late returns remained unchanged. Hey, why are there so many nights you come home late? Is it really that often? I have a lot going on, like overtime and socializing with my boss. I see. Indeed, his pay stubs showed overtime pay. And I could understand the socializing part. Still, it seemed excessive. I even wondered if Michael might be cheating. I had thought about that. However, I just couldn't see him as that type of person. I still believed in him somewhere deep down. I couldn't understand why I was so convinced he would never cheat. Even as my business trips increased, Michael made no effort to do household chores. Incapable of even heating up a ready-made curry, he resorted to convenience store meals or eating out. When I was away on long business trips, he would even ask his mother to come over to our house. I had hoped he would learn to manage himself, but he seemed to have no intention of doing so. It was more reassuring to have his mother over than to let him mess up the house. But that, undoubtedly, increased her burden. I'm really sorry for the trouble my frequent business trips have caused. It's okay, Sandra. You haven't done anything wrong, but sooner or later, we need to teach that boy how to take care of the house. I'm worried about the future. Well, I can teach him household chores anytime. You're right. I'm sorry. I'll talk to him too. Really? Thank you. Margaret spoke kindly, but her tone seemed a bit cold. Of course, Michael was unaware of such a conversation between me and his mother. He just lay on the sofa, watching TV as usual. This show is so funny. Oblivious to my presence in the kitchen, he started talking to me. What show? Oh, sorry. Are you washing the dishes? He said sorry but didn't seem to feel guilty. At first, I was angry at him for this, but I've gotten used to it now. It's sad when I think about it. However, the day was coming when this routine would end. One day, I was offered an opportunity for an overseas business trip. It was a stressful job, but fulfilling? I could have declined, but I decided to take it. The trip would last two years. During that time, Michael could go back to his parents' house or try to manage the household chores himself. That night, when I discussed the trip with him, he was surprised. Are you going to be on the business trip for that long? Yo, that's right. I could have declined, but I wanted to challenge myself. I know it's going to be a burden on you during this time. Not seeing each other for a while was certain. I would have been happy if he felt even a little lonely, but it didn't seem like he had those feelings much. I got it. Good luck. I'll try to manage things on my own. He said that with a big smile. Are you sure you'll be okay? Yay, don't worry. His reaction made it seem like he couldn't wait for me to leave. Months after the overseas business trip was announced, the day to depart finally arrived. Are you really okay with this? Yo, yeah, don't worry. If anything happens, I'll just ask my mom for help. I see. Anyway, are you on time? Oh, I might be running late. I'm heading out now. Michael seemed eager for me to leave. Probably wanting some space to himself. Honestly, it was infuriating. But there was no time to complain. 
I sincerely said goodbye to him and left the house. For the next two years, I worked overseas. There were many challenges, but it was an enjoyable life. This experience has become nourishment for my life. I was certain of it. While overseas, I kept in touch with Michael regularly. I was relieved to hear that he was able to live with the help of his mother. Initially, we mostly talked on the phone, but gradually shifted to text messages. From the messages, I could tell he was doing good, so I wasn't too worried. Two years later, my business trip ended and the day to return home arrived. I was somewhat excited to see Michael face to face after such a long time. My steps were light. He would be home, taking the day off as usual. I wanted to ask about his life while I was away and share my experiences abroad. Excited, I unlocked the front door. But my excitement quickly faded. A foul smell wafted through the air. It was causing me to break out in a cold sweat. It felt like something terrible had happened. I set my luggage down and searched the house. Where was the source of the smell? Where was Michael? My hands were shaking uncontrollably as I opened the door to the room. I checked each room one by one, and finally, I opened the door to Michael's bedroom. What is this? I couldn't believe my eyes. What on earth is going on? There was Michael, mummified. I couldn't comprehend what was happening in front of me. I need to call the police. I quickly grabbed my phone and called the police. Within minutes, officers arrived at the house. As the investigation progressed, I, being the first to discover the scene, was questioned. I had been messaging with someone up until just before the end of my trip feeling suspicion that someone else was involved. I've been on my business trip for about two years. When I came back, I found it like this. A business trip, I see. If you find the business trip dubious, you can check with my company. I just got back, so I can show evidence like my plane ticket. May we see that, please? I complied with the officer's request providing contact information for my company and evidence like my plane ticket. As a result, my suspicions were cleared. However, that raised more questions. Who had been replying to my messages? It was strange that Michael hadn't sought help until his death. And someone from work should have visited the house before it got to this point. I discussed these points with the police and showed them the messages as evidence. Indeed. You've been communicating with him until recently. What does this mean? The more I fought, the more baffling everything seemed. The officers seemed suspicious and decided to conduct a thorough investigation. After initial conversation, I remembered my mill, Margaret. I spoke to the police before contacting her immediately. Margaret, actually. What, Michael? As I explained the situation, she's voice trembled. Is that true? Tell me. Yes. The police are here investigating right now. All right, I'm coming over now. She said and hung up. Given the close proximity of our homes, she arrived at my house in about 10 minutes. Michael. Ma'am, please calm down. How can I be calm? My son is dead. She tried to push past the police to get to Michael. Understandably, losing one's own son would be deeply saddening. I could comprehend even without children of my own. Sandra. When, when did you find him? Just now. I just got back and then. That's terrible. Her eyes were filled with sorrow. 
Later, the police explained what would happen next. Throughout the conversation, Margaret held my hand tightly, staying close to me, her body shaking. A few days later, the police shared the results of their inquiries. It appeared that during my absence, a woman other than Margaret had been coming in and out of the house. Just from hearing about her, it's clear that the woman seems suspicious. Upon asking for her description, it turned out to be a woman I didn't know. To begin with, I didn't know any woman who would visit our home like that. Fortunately, Michael hadn't locked his phone, so after speaking with the police, I checked it immediately. A woman's name caught my eye. Patricia Russell. The messages made it clear she was a work contact, but I couldn't shake the feeling that their relationship went beyond just that. Meetups, movies, drinks. From what I could gather, it seemed that Michael and Patricia were having an affair. As I went through the messages, words like hotel and date were scattered throughout the messages. It turned out she had been visiting her home and taking care of him while I was away. This can't be. Did you find something? Well, I told the officer about the existence of Patricia and expressed my suspicion that she was definitely the woman who had been coming and going from our house. The officer reviewed the messages and agreed with my assessment. Later, they decided to contact her directly to gather more information. A few days later, the police contacted me again. Apparently, Patricia expressed a desire to meet with me. Despite having had an affair, she dared to request a meeting with me, Michael's wife. Feeling overwhelmed by the recent events, such thoughts crossed my mind. According to the police, she was not involved in the main incident. That only deepened my curiosity about who had been messaging me. Okay, in a week, then? Amidst growing doubts, I decided to meet with her. Maybe she knew something? What were her thoughts on the affair? I wondered. Eager for the truth, I awaited the day. A week later, I went to the specified meeting room and met Patricia face to face. I thought she had no common sense because she was a cheater. However, my thoughts were quickly overturned. I'm truly sorry. What? I had an affair with Michael. I frequented your house. I know it's unforgivable. I'm so sorry. She immediately apologized upon seeing me. Well. Oh, I, I'm sorry. So sudden. Um, how did you and he? I asked her how she met Michael, and I asked what their relationship was like before the affair. As expected, she said they were superior and team members at work, and she became his direct supervisor in their work relationship. They became more and more involved in sexual relations. She had been taking care of Michael while I was on business trips, but then, she revealed a shocking fact. I didn't know Michael had died. I found out from the police. That's odd. What happened at work? He quit over a year ago. He quit? Yes, he was tired of it all, and... And... It's hard for me to say this, but he said he wanted to divorce you and marry me. He thought he could live off my salary without working. Hearing about his selfishness, I was speechless. To think he wanted to leave me to marry Patricia. And then quit his job to live off her salary. I was a bit shocked to realize that he was more selfish than I had initially thought. Thank you for sharing this with me. It's nothing. But you didn't know he had died? When did you stop visiting? Over a year ago. Why? Even though Michael wanted to marry you? 
I couldn't help but speak harshly. The conversation turned tense, but Patricia explained what happened. After a few months of my departure, she used to visit our house every five days, primarily to care for Michael. At first, it seemed to be going well. She felt like an exciting new married life, but her enthusiasm quickly faded. The reason was Michael's inability to maintain the household. Despite being cautioned, he made no effort to tidy up. Over time, her feelings for him completely cooled off. And after she broke up with him, she stopped coming to the house. After quitting his job, he contacted her repeatedly. He wanted her to come back and to start over. The messages varied, but consistently expressed his desire to reconcile. However, she no longer felt the same way and continued to ignore him. Eventually, the communications from him stopped completely. Since then, she seemed to have no knowledge of what became of him. That's what happened. Yes. It's good to know what happened while I was away. Thank you. I'm the one who should apologize. Patricia seemed genuinely remorseful, continuously apologizing. While her sincerity was evident, whether I could forgive her was another matter. Fortunately, she offered to pay compensation, which I accepted. It was clear she had no direct involvement in the incident. But the mystery only deepened. During this time, the police received a tip from our neighbors. The person who had seen my mill, Margaret, entering the house just days before my return. The police also viewed her with suspicion due to this eyewitness information. If that's true, then she must know something. Without prior knowledge, I hadn't thought to check messages between Michael and his mother. Until now, it never occurred to me that she might know something, so I never thought to check the messages between them. Upon reflection, I think if I had looked at all the messages from the start, things might not have escalated to this point. I went through each messages carefully. Then, a particular message caught my eye. Was he feeling ill? After Michael was dumped by Patricia and left alone, it seems he fell ill. He couldn't seek help from Patricia or me. In that situation, Michael reached out to his own mother. However, the response from her was cold and distant. Just deal with it on your own. She had said other things that seemed like she was abandoning him. I'm tired of caring about you. Whatever happens to you doesn't matter to me. It was hard to believe that his mother, who seemed to adore Michael so much and grieved his death more than anyone, would say such things. But looking at the messages, it was clear she was involved somehow. Reading those messages from her confirmed my suspicions. After submitting the messages from the smartphone to the police, they decided to summon her for questioning. The police contacted her, and it was arranged for us to speak at the police station on a later date. I was allowed to be present, so I decided to attend. On the day of the meeting, Margaret arrived at the police station looking somewhat irritable. Hasn't the culprit been caught? What about that woman who was taking care of Michael? Please, calm down. After being admonished by the officer, she crossed her legs and glared at us. The police then relayed information from neighbors about her frequent visits to the house and the messages I had seen. The neighbors saw me. That's no proof. She's much more suspicious than I am. But you were seen entering and leaving the house recently, right? Where's the proof? It's not just about proof. We've heard from several neighbors, not just one. How do you explain that? She seemed very agitated. 
She was breathing heavily and snapping at the police officer. Watching this, I became even more suspicious of her. Margaret, do you really know nothing? I don't know anything. Is that true? How long were you visiting the house? I don't remember. What about the neighbor's statements? Are you suggesting the police are lying or that the neighbors have conspired against you? Yes, it is. But think about it. There's no reason for them to go out of their way to frame you like this. Unless, do you have any reason to believe they would do such a thing? Despite the clear suspicion, she kept insisting she knew nothing. Even though there are witnesses, she was stubborn. Her attitude infuriated me, and I pressed her further. Initially, she insisted on her innocence, but eventually, she seemed to resign and revealed a shocking truth. Yes, it was me. I abandoned Michael. Are you happy now? Margaret. Because he was just so annoying. Though I somewhat expected it, it turned out Margaret had indeed abandoned Michael in his state. The reason being that he was bothersome, which is a rather selfish justification. He was annoying. I was tired of him always depending on me. Just when I thought he was finally married and settled, he kept finding reasons to lean on me again. Never really learned to do any household chores, always leaving everything to others. I took care of him because I felt obligated as his parents, but honestly, I resented it. Then he caught a cold and wanted me to come over. I saw it as an opportunity and left him alone. Next thing I knew, he had passed away. She spoke dispassionately about her feelings towards Michael. However, her feelings were not the kind a parent should have for their child. They were distorted emotions. Have you been the one replying to my messages all this time? Yes, it was me. I thought you'd worry if suddenly the messages stopped. I knew it would come out eventually, but I figured it might buy some time. You knew it would come out, didn't you? Of course, but then Patricia showed up, and I thought maybe I could pin the blame on her, but that didn't work out. She appeared somewhat frustrated. It was unbelievable that she could have abandoned him. While I was shocked, I remembered her words before my trip. He needs to learn to do chores soon, or I'm worried about the future. Perhaps she had already disliked him from that time. Thinking this made me feel helpless. To shift the blame like that. Well, what other choice did I have? I didn't want to get involved with the police. If Patricia could have taken all the blame, I wouldn't have to be here. That's just too selfish. Sure, marrying me and dealing with my frequent business trips might have increased your burden, but that's no excuse to abandon someone. Be quiet. You don't understand how I feel. Margaret yelled at me as if venting years of resentment. But I didn't back down and continued. I understand some of your feelings, Margaret. He never learned to do chores, always messed up the house, and then he had an affair. I was honestly furious too, but there's a difference between right and wrong. What you did constitutes a serious crime, and that fact will haunt you for a long time. As I continued to speak to her desperately, Margaret finally recognized what she had done. She will have to live with being known as the person who abandoned her son. The thought of how painful that would be. It will follow me forever. She muttered, tears streaming down her face. I did that. Please reconsider what you've done. She nodded weakly in response. Shortly after, she was taken to another room for further proceedings. Surrounded by police, she appeared smaller than ever as she was moved to another room. 
She was arrested for neglecting Michael's body for an extended period. The trial will determine the specific charges, which remain unclear. Listening to her story, I felt a degree of sympathy. I too had been exasperated by Michael's behavior many times. However, there are limits, and her actions were irredeemable. I hope she deeply reflects on what she did. After her arrest, I moved out immediately. I just didn't want to be in that house anymore. And now I live alone in a clean apartment. Doing chores like cleaning and laundry, just for myself, makes everything much easier. Yet, I can't help but have lingering thoughts of Michael. If this had been a divorce, it might have felt refreshing, but I never expected to part ways like this. Losing my husband this way made me realize I did love him. To distract from these overwhelming feelings, I immerse myself in work each day 